and welcome to part 5 of the Praxis Table Talks analysis of Julius Evola's Revolt Against the Modern World. My name is Vincent, I'm the founder of Praxia, and I have with me a member of our leadership council. Cody, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. It's very nice to be back. Sorry we've been on a bit of a hiatus, if you've noticed the gap in the videos, but we're chugging full steam ahead. Yeah, exactly. It, it actually, yeah, it has been a while since we've sat down to record, so, you know, it's nice to be back into the swing of things. So I actually did sit down because it's been so long and I reread the previous chapters we talked about in the last one and then went on to reread the ones we're talking about today. And it's nice because with each reread, the pieces kind of fall into place quicker, you know, because you understand where, where the author is going to go with the subject matter once he, once he mentions one thing or another. So it's, uh, it, was, it was nice to sit down and, and re-experience that once again. Um, regardless, the chapters we talked about previously dealt with the ideas of initiation, and though that one was rather, you know, limited to royal initiation, we need to remember that initiation wasn't limited to royalty, but was instead a super common occurrence that was really the means by which the traditional society operated, you know, through different degrees of initiation into, let's say, the warrior caste or uh, academic pursuits or, or really anything, because it was it was necessary to prepare the next generation to assume the roles of the masters of their vocation. So we talked about that last time. We also covered, in the words of the chapter title, the relationship between royalty and priesthood, which detailed Evola's take on the, arrange, or, uh, the arrangement of the dichotomy between spiritual and temporal authorities. And it's really a false dichotomy, if you ask me. And then uh, we ended on the chapter titled Universality and Centralism, which stressed the importance of a universal and unifying essence, which bound together the traditional society, which was that of the empire. Though this empire wasn't in the way we picture, you know, political empire, but rather a spiritual one, which transcended locality and unified the people of a given society, regardless of caste or orientation and so on. So that's what we talked about last time. And this time, we'll, the titles of the chapters we'll be talking about, will uh, they begin with chapter 13, the soul of chivalry, going on to 14, the doctrine of the castes, and then on to 15, professional associations and the arts and slavery. And so to summarize, We'll first be talking about the idea of chivalry, and then Avola goes, you know, into deep detail about the forms of chivalry, and then the esoteric implications of those forms as he goes on in the chapter. And then we will be dealing, uh, we'll be going on to talk about what I would say is probably the most important, uh, if not one of the most important chapters in this book, which details the idea behind the caste system and why the system is so important to the traditional society. And then we'll finish off with the idea of what Evola calls the professional associations, which you would think of as different scientific or practical or occupational lineages, which acted as the different subsystems that supported the traditional society and how important it was for them to remain linked to the traditional idea, which is, you know, that divinely derived legitimacy and an orientation towards a higher state of being. So, Cody, do you want to give a brief summary of your thoughts before we go in? Well, I thought it was definitely... A very interesting set of chapters because Evola was now tackling the modern world as he saw it instead of um, or at least dipping into that uh, before he gets into the split of the book with you know revolt against the modern world and his setup of uh, the traditional world up until this point hadn't really mentioned much of what modernity uh, has laid waste to except in these chapters now and we see the comparisons there with uh, the caste systems and the spiritual essence of our civilizations being in all essence absent compared to our ancestors and all of these effects kind of culminating in a downward spiral, downwards orientation um, spiraling that is feeding into itself into the eventual collapse of all of our collective civilizations, not just in the West, but practically the entire globe as everything industrializes and modernizes and uh, mimics the Western hegemony that's uh, existed over the rule of the world for the last 200 years, three, closer to like three or 400 years if you're focusing on Western Europe, uh, 150 if you're looking at just America. But even still, it's um, what Evola was seeing even in his time as a young man and through the process of writing this book throughout most of his life, the progression and the very rapid deterioration of how things started versus how um, they've gotten even worse towards the end of his life in him 
digesting all of these points and reflecting upon all of these uh, sacred rites and traditions and orientations meant to be passed down from generation to generation that just almost went with a hard stop uh, around the Industrial Revolution um, with so much of our society. And it's thinking about it from Evola's point of view, um, it's a very sad realization in many ways. It's like a, a Nietzschean sort of... Um, not euphoria. What's the other word? Not nihilism, um, but... Kind of... No, no, no. But similar to realization. I just didn't want to repeat myself. Yeah. And it's that same sort of grappling with um, what we're left with now and oh, how to move like forward a, beyond that. A, a epitome, or... No. That's epiphany. A, epiphany, yes. Yeah, epiphany, epiphany was the that's, word. Yeah, Thank you. There you go. Um, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's... With Evola in his in his lifetime experiencing the things as he did, you know, he was born before World War Two, which was around the time where the the second estate or you know the military caste still had some type of legitimacy uh, in you know global politics or uh, you know even just in in wider society in general, and so he went from that to experiencing World War Two um, after the collapse of the second estate, um, and then experienced the this extreme third and fourth estate, uh, I guess, hegemony uh, after after World War Two, which you know completely overtook Italy and completely overtook Germany as they as they reformed those civilizations and Japan especially, and uh, so you know he he almost it, it's funny because he did go back and revise this book again and again. Um, the first iteration came out in 1936, which was before World War II, but he revised it until his death. And you can kind of tell uh, where some of the revisions are as you go in, like as you go further into the book. You can kind of see where his opinions have changed, and that's why I think there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of contradictions throughout his writing in this book because this was this was his life's work. You know, it was his magnum opus, and so you can see how his attitude changed um, kind of drastically as he had some type of he had a certain type of hopeful optimism before world war ii that what was coming with these with the rise of these new ideologies in the face of liberalism could have been turned into something positive and then once he realized the true nature of these ideologies he again uh he kind of shut them out and shunned them and then it, it was a moot point anyways because they lost the war you know so it was you could really tell how his perspective changed and you can kind of see that throughout this book which is kind of interesting um and you know a large part of that has to do with what we're talking about today you know uh with the ideas of of chivalry and the caste system and uh even professional associations being all so closely linked together these are these are these chapters do go well together i think because um like you said they kind of they finally start making attacks on modern society they kind of start you know, showing his distaste for all of the inversion that these things have gone under. Because we've talked about previously, you know, how we have, um, we kind of have the essence of what these things should be, um, which has been fully removed, but we still have the substance still there, which, you know, the the, uh, the priestly caste could, ex for example, be uh, understood as like the, the modern media, you know, and the, the warrior castes could be understood as, you know, the, the political caste w waging, um, Econo uh, not economic warfare, but uh, political warfare, or, you know, we, we have all these functions still, but they're just not embodied by the same types of people that should embody these functions, and so we get um, this is where this inversion comes about, and so he makes attacks against that in these chapters, which I think is pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. And so, let's get right into it in the, uh, the Soul of Chivalry, chapter 13. Yep, definitely. So, he starts this chapter by saying, uh, well, it starts off at, by saying, As I have previously indicated, not only regality, but traditional nobility as well was or, uh, originally characterized by a spiritual element. As we did for regality, let us consider the case in which this element is not the natural, but rather the acquired possession of nobility. So, again, we're talking about initiation here. And so, a little bit... Uh, a little bit lower, he says, To begin with, we must be aware of the difference that existed during the European Middle Ages between the feudal and knightly aristocracy. The former was connected to land and a faithfulness to a given prince. Knighthood instead appeared as a superterritorial and supranational community in which its members who were considered to be merely, uh, who were consecrated to military priesthood no longer had a homeland and were bound by faithfulness not to people, but on the one hand to an ethics that had as its fundamental values honor, truth, courage, and loyalty, and on the other hand, to a spiritual authority of the of a universal type, 
which was essentially that of the empire. So what Evola is essentially doing here is detailing the differentiation between the greater and lesser types of being. And we see this differentiation in all types of organizations throughout the traditional society, including the differentiation between the different types of aristocracies, those being the landed aristocracy, which would, what he called the feudal aristocracy, and then the knightly aristocracy. And the important bit here is that once a person becomes initiated into the knightly aristocracy, they suddenly assume a universal archetype, and then they also get assumed by this universal archetype. So so that their physical characteristics do not limit them from participating in this higher form of being. And Evola even goes as far as to say that they no longer have a homeland. And this is the point that I want to stress because this doesn't only apply to the knightly aristocracy. This is actually a common element to almost all forms of proper initiation. And I must stress proper initiation. Um, regardless of form, and even regardless as to whether or not that initiation conveys some type of aristocracy, so it could be just a, a common initiation into some type of uh, some type of vocational lineage. And so once one becomes initiated into a certain lineage or tradition, the person sheds their temporal attributes and assumes the attributes of the lineage into which they're being initiated, which means that the heritage of the group becomes their heritage, not in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense, where the initiate is quite literally the, the spiritual successor of, you know, the previous masters and members of the lineage. And then since we are dealing with, you know, spirituality, the principle of universality applies, which means that these things, uh, these, these lineages are universal themselves, and therefore transcend the physical limitations of things like locality. And so, as such, the, the initiate no longer retains those connections to things like homeland, but instead he, he participates in the, the universality of the initiatic lineage. They assume that higher archetype and their the temporal characteristics become null, kind of in lieu of that. Um, however, when... And, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, you almost done? Uh, I, I have a little bit more, but you can go ahead. All right. Sorry to interrupt, because um, I, I wanted to just bring up an example to demonstrate this point more sure. uh, and, and complement what you're saying. Uh, to bring in a more modern example of that type of mentality and then to show in contrast its deterioration over just the last century or so, uh, we can see with examples like the um, British Armed Forces and the officers that held ranks within the uh, the service of, of, you know, the king and queen of the um, the Royal Army and how dignified and universally... Uh, respected that those officers were because they carried that sense of uh, aristocracy and initiation uh, with them in holding their rank and, and wearing their uniform and the uh, dignity and regality in which they carried themselves and then imparted upon all the people they interacted with regardless of where they were because even though they did serve and had um, faithful loyalty to the British Empire and the uh, the king and queen whoever was ruling at the time, they could exist anywhere within the British Empire and, you know, almost be like um, low-tier governors, uh, in a sense, to, to keep order and justice and that civility of which they are imparting upon any other part of the, uh, the world uh, that the British Empire sort of reigns over, whether it be India or North Africa or um, East Africa, South Africa... Uh, somewhere in like Afghanistan or so on, um, even in face of all the opposition that they uh, had from the locals, they still tried to treat all those people with dignity, even um, when faced with massive backlash. Even in, in the face of battle, they had an air of um, respect and dignity and chivalry as a uh, knight would to his foes and his allies uh, all alike because of that, that human essence there that existed in the role that they were, um, that they had acquired. And that's what gave them sort of this distinguishing characteristic that we can see nowadays has almost kind of disappeared where we see soldiers and officers and even generals acting universally, almost like degenerates going in the complete opposite direction of what they're, uh, you know, ancestral tradition, even the more modern sense of these uh, modern standing militaries have previously been known to uh, to be. And I'm not too well aware of, you know, the controversies that go on with the British Armed Forces, 
but there's plenty you can see in uh, the American armed services and um, plenty in, in any military around the world on uh, soldiers acting a fool off base or uh, in some other protectorate zone like um, U.S. bases in, say, Germany or Japan or somewhere like that where they constantly get in trouble for not acting with any dignity or sense of purpose and um, chivalry as, you know, their uniforms would imply. And so there's that distinct downgrade of quality in just a century's time where uh, there are reports of, you know, the British military um, or British naval members on the Titanic that were helping as it was sinking, um, being an absolute calm, directing people to lifeboats, uh, facing their imminent death with the absolute austerity. And then uh, just a century later, you know, controversies come out on uh, sexual assaults and um, other, you know, degeneracies and, and criminalities from the armed services. And that was just well within Evel's lifetime. He was 13 when the Titanic sank and, you know, he died in the late 70s, I believe, and could see the deterioration thereof, um, especially, you know, post-sexual revolution in uh, Europe. Yeah, that's that's a really good example, too, because the uh, the um, the British armed forces or uh, the, the British, like the uh, the royal military were you're you're right they were and they were of a universal type and they almost exercised this universality everywhere they went you know and you mentioned that how they could be uh you know in different locations they would still have to treat the citizens the same way it, it was a reflection on them if they did not act with dignity and respect and excuse me i feel like people think that this is some type of romanticization and to some degree i do i i believe that a, a romanticization does happen but not to any not to any high degree and these people you know uh, i think we need to stop thinking it uh, stop thinking of it as that and start to understand that uh you know these people back in the day who who did exemplify these um who, who first of all took these oaths and uh these oaths actually meant something to them um both religiously and and personally uh they did understand that they were being initiated into this tradition and it's funny that you bring that up because that was exactly where I was going with my last point. Um, you know, when mm. one is initiated into a lineage, they they also assume the characteristics associated with people of that lineage. And so this would be things like the responsibilities and duties of being in that lineage. So they have to adhere to the, uh, the initiatic archetype in, in a sense. So when the knight is initiated into the knightly aristocracy, they also participate in that, that higher realm of being. And they now have a duty to behave like a knight and adhere to the knightly code and to be chivalric. And, you know, this is also emphasized by the fact that along that implicit universal knightly aristocracy, uh, or I, I guess along, uh, you know, there, there are also a number of, sh there are also a number of chivalric orders to which knights would have to swear oaths to as well, which came with its own code of conduct and its own way of life and a broader mission. And a large part of that was the idea of chivalry, and um, it translates very much into what you were saying as well with the uh, with the the royal military. But and it's again, it's not just limited to uh, feudal Europe. You know, chivalry was this broad, um, broad and almost perennial and universal understanding. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about that later. But yeah, you know, we've actually made a whole podcast surrounding the ideas of masculinity and femininity, and a large part of that conversation in that podcast surrounded the idea of chivalry for the masculine side and damehood for the feminine. So, um, yeah, that was, that was a great example. Um, and to compliment that, if I may. Yeah, sure. Evola does bring up later too, on, uh, what you were just saying with not only the, um, competence of character of these people swearing these oaths to these higher, or higher orders, but in the execution of their disciplines, it is shown of a higher quality of work, um, that is proof of what kind of men they were in the relics and the architecture that's left behind from these civilizations past, from these empires past, from these um, workers past, because there was a certain uh, 
spiritual and metaphysical orientation about them that wasn't just aimed at the uh, material or um, monetary cost of whatever they were uh, laboring to do. And we'll get into that in more detail once we get to it, but it's good to keep in mind that the sneering of, um, you know, modern peoples to reject the behaviors of, you know, our Other ancestors. Heroes, yeah. yeah, is just an asinine thing to do because of, you know, the higher quality of men that did exist back then. It's funny and that, that even uh, though it's funny in that we our, record this on, on Veterans Day. Yeah, <laughs> that is true too. And that, but that's a whole different can of worms that um, we can get into some other time. Yeah. Um, and it, it, sorry. Sorry, I completely derailed you. Didn't mean to do that. No, no, it's, it's, it happens. Um, my point was just to finish is that, um, Oh, you did completely derail me. I'm so sorry. Um, I'll most likely get back to it some other time, but uh, getting back into the chapter. Yeah, it is it's it is that same idea. Um, <laughs> uh, Evola goes on to say that uh, knighthood did not necessarily have a hereditary character. It was possible to become a knight as long as the person wishing to become one performed feats that could demonstrate both this heroic, uh, his heroic contempt for attachment to life as well as the above-mentioned faithfulness. Um, in both senses of the term. In the older versions of knightly ordination, a knight was ordained by another knight without the intervention of priests, almost as if in the warrior there was a force similar to a fluid that was capable of creating new knights by direct transmission. A witness to this practice is found in the Indo-Aryan tradition of warriors ordaining other warriors. Later on, a special religious rite was developed aimed at ordaining knights. And this, again, is not just true for the knightly aristocracy, but is also applicable to almost all forms of initiation. The hereditary element allowed for strong predictions to be made in the way of what dispositions of uh, 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 what dispositions a person might possess, but it isn't necessary for the characteristic to actually be present, and it's not required for initiation to take place. And another analogy that might work better than the fluid analogy is the initiation is like using a single candle to light a bunch of other candles where the fire in the first one is, you know, it's no less potent even after generating fire in, in other candles. And so um, now having gotten that intro out of the way, Evola gets more into the idea of chivalry. And one of the themes he brings up, which is almost a constant throughout the different orders and, and such, is the dedication of heroic action to a woman. And he says... Uh, let's see. He says, The knights dedicated their heroic deeds to a woman. This devotion assumes such extreme forms in European chivalry that we should regard them as an absurd and aber um, aberrant phenomenon, if taken literally. To, to avow unconditional faithfulness to a woman was one of the most recurrent themes in chivalrous groups, according to the theology of the castles. Oh, sorry. According to the theology of the castles, there was little doubt that a knighthood or a knight who died for his woman shared the same promise of blessed immortality achieved by a crusader who had died to liberate the temple. In this context, a faithfulness to God and to a woman appeared to coincide. And, um, and he gets at the root of the esoteric meaning behind this dedication, which we can already see on the surface is the masculine devotion to the feminine. But in a sense, he references all the traditions in which chivalry is an apparent idea, because, like I said, it's not just a medieval European phenomenon. It's also part of a number of different traditions. And in each of these traditions' mythologies, the woman is portrayed to have this same value. So Evola points at uh, Hebe in the Greek tradition, Gunlad and Freya and Brunhild in the Norse tradition. And he refers to the Egyptian women who offer the key of life and resurrection. And he even brings up this significance in the Aztec mythology as well. Um, and so this... The significance is, again, um, the idea of, where is it here? He says that essentially uh, that that woman, as it has been documented in the case of the worshippers of love or love's lieges, is essentially a representation of holy wisdom or a perceived embodiment in different degrees of the transcendent divine woman who represents the power of a transfiguring spirituality and of a life unaffected by death. So, in a sense, it represents this idea again of the I, I would say it represents the idea of the the same idea that the uh church took upon itself for the identity of itself um which was that of the uh transmissive 
um, feminine force uh, in contrast to the, uh, you know, the, the regal masculine um, aristocratic type force. And so, and he also differentiates between the woman as the symbol of chivalry as opposed to that of gynecocracy, but uh, he finishes up the focus on the woman by saying, let's see here. Um, the persistent repeated use of feminine characters, which is typical of cycles of a heroic type, in reality means nothing else but this. Even when confronting the power that may enlighten him and lead him to something more than human, the only ideal of the hero and of the knight is that active and affirmative attitude that in every normal civilization characterizes a true man as opposed to a woman. This is the mystery that in more or less hidden form has shaped a part of the chivalrous medieval literature that was familiar to the so-called courts of love, since it was able to confer a deeper meaning to the often debated question whether a woman ought to prefer a cleric or a knight. And uh, he goes on to focus other symbols such as the horse of the knight being closely symb and symbolically linked um, about the importance of weapons and such having a close relationship with their owner, which was uh, a big part of the samurai tradition. I think you know a, a bit more about that, Cody, than uh, than I would be able to. A little bit. Yeah, so, would you be able to like uh, tell us anything about? Oh, it? oh, to to give examples. I thought you meant to keep talking. Oh, no, um, I apologize. Yeah, with the chivalric order of Bushido in Japanese culture, um, is an ancient one that definitely rivals that of the chivalric order of knights in uh, feudal and going on into knightly Europe, which Evla does distinguish um, to be separate eras. And um, in the Japanese frame of mind about it, which Evla does point out, the weapon a samurai carries, whether it be his, his uh, katana in, in wakazashi or whatever other armament that he brings to battle or carries with him in his daily life, is meant to be a physical manifestation of his soul as a warrior and any time in many of these orders that they are to draw their weapon um and this is even found in you know uh warrior sects like the uh, gurkhas in oh gurkhas are found in a few different countries but um specifically in uh, singapore uh anytime they draw their blade Blood must be drawn as as a consequence, and so sometimes when they want to show their their knife to someone, if if they they find interest in it, uh, they'll cut themselves just slightly to honor that um, sacred right of any time their weapon is drawn, blood must be drawn as well, because it's that manifestation of who they are meant to be, the role they are meant to play, uh, and there's a certain responsibility and dignity in every action they commit to and so if a situation is serious enough where you know this showing of their their soul uh must be pronounced then it's it will bear the necessary consequences um and that was seen in the brutality of you know japanese culture uh at the time where uh when a samurai even learns a new technique or acquires a new weapon and and has mastery over it uh they will sometimes go out and <laughs> uh, attack um random people on the street to whatchamacallit sorry to practice or demonstrate or um see in action this new technique or weapon uh in its its fullest effect and while that may sound kind of you know, crazy in a sense to uh, attack just a, you know a random innocent person. It was a different mentality of the sort of right of regality they had in being of that higher caste and higher um, essence of person in Japanese society. And so, it might seem a little deranged in our modern sensibilities, but uh, we have a full set of derangements that we sort of tolerate in a society today that would be equally if not more so intensely rejected by people of our past even not that long ago including the the japanese society that you mentioned oh yeah and as as much as people like to point out and make fun of the japanese for being you know degenerates or um perverts in in many senses a lot of that is very, very underground 
and it's not very tolerated at all in um, to be displayed in um, regular average uh, society. You know, like everybody going about their day. Yeah. Um, any sort of display of of sort of these degeneracies, whether they be sexual or some other um, affliction or or fascination that people have that is way outside the bounds of, you know, normal respectable society is very intensely um, looked down upon and shamed because of that culture of saving face and conformity that the Japanese and many other um, Asiatic nations have and people and Asiatic peoples share. Yeah. In the next part, uh, he talks about the relationship between the idea of chivalry and the form of Catholic Christianity that was present in the European Middle Ages. So he says, It is true that the knight almost always included in his vows the defense of, faith, uh, the, defense of the faith. This should be taken as a generic sign of a militant commitment to something super-individual rather than a conscious profession of faith in a specific theological sense. And uh, to, to an extent, I, agree, or I, I would agree. Um, he says, just by scraping a little bit off the surface, it becomes evident that the strongest quote-unquote trunks of the sprouting of knighthood derived their sap from orders and movements that had the odor of heresy to the church, to the point of being persecuted by her. And so we have to recognize, right, that in this time of Evola's life when he wrote this book, though it did go through many editions post-release, he was very much not in favor of the progressed Christianity that existed during his time or during the uh, European Middle Ages as well. And so he would emphasize in large part the perennialism of different systems in Christianized society, almost in contrast to Christianity, to show that these traditions had deeper roots than the Christian dogma. And I commend him for that because it's important to understand the universal idea that, you know, it's important to understand the universal ideal all that much more. And he's even correct in the fact that chivalry in the esoteric sense does have certain elements to it that under certain pretexts and um, and such um, would be deemed as heretical to the church. But I don't think that we should take his disfavor of the form of Christianity as a hatred towards all of Christianity. And I'll get at why in a minute. But I also don't think that using his words as a reason to demonize Christianity is something that we should do or even something that he would want us to do. But we do have to be pragmatic enough to understand that apart from what certain very dogmatic theological doctrines may say in favor of the church, the church is an earthly institution and is, like all earthly institutions, susceptible, sorry, I can't speak here, susceptible to subversion and, you know, alterations that, you know, alterations that may uh, change the nature of some previously understood and holistic doctrine. And we do also have to remember that Christianity did sever its connection with its initiatic aspect pretty early on, which is why the knightly and chivalric orders of the Middle Ages differed so much from ordinary church doctrine and had that air of heretical practice around them, because pretty early on, the church stopped understanding the esoteric implications of its own dogma. And unless one does understand that esotericism and... You know, once one does understand the, the, the implication, I guess, a lot of the implicit and unofficial practices that were unique only to its offshoots or to branches of the church, but not to the church itself, could be considered heretical. And that's why Evola is pointing out here, or that's, that's, uh, is why Evola is pointing that out here. Um, a good example of that is, uh, this is kind of a tangent as well, but Meister Eckhart was a, uh, Dominican friar who, was very much a mystic and a theologian in his own right. And he would write things, um, you know, he would write sermons and and uh, papers and essays and things like that on theology. And he was very much respected by the church and by his community at the time, by the religious community at the time. Um, but he also had some mystic influences and some uh, unorthodox influences as well. And so he would write things which were probably, uh, I would say, at, at least according to me and according to people who would side with him, um, they were very much in line with church doctrine. And he made sure to preface them with, uh, he made sure to preface them by saying, essentially, that if you don't understand the pretext, um, what I'm about to say might come off as heretical. And uh, 
after his death, I believe, he was tried for heresy. No, he was tried for heresy in his life, and then he died, and then he was found innocent of heresy, apart from hmm. one or two things that he uh, um, wrote. Uh, and he and I think the uh, conclusion was that if you read that, you had to read it within that within those uh, within the context in which he wrote it. So essentially, he was he was got off scot free. But the church did deem him as a heretic because what he wrote did, like Evola says, have the odor of heresy to it because um, it went not against but beyond what church dogma was uh, allowing to be taught at the time. And so, is he now? Is he now canonized as a saint? I, I would have to check. I don't think so. I don't think he is. But he's a okay. he's a very influential figure in uh, in theology and um, esoteric philosophy as well. So he's not he's not by any means you know brushed under the rug. Um, I think the church does. Uh, I, I would have to. I, I don't want to make any claims. I would have to research the relationship the church has with his works. But I know that mm-hmm. I know that they were not deemed as heretical. Um, oh. I guess you'd have to look into which church as well, because yeah. there is the difference between you know Orthodox and, and Catholic and so on. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, but Catholic it wouldn't be the first say. time. Yes, um, but it wouldn't be the first time that the the church, uh, Catholic Church specifically, had found someone guilty of heresy and then canonized them later. Uh, Joan of Arc being one of the most famous ones, but um, yeah, that actually it was similar to what I wanted to bring up before about a, a quote from. John uh, Chrysostom, he, he's a saint from ooh, 400 AD, uh, and he was talking about uh, bringing it back to the uh, devotion that chivalry brings to a woman on, you know, how a man and a woman ought to act once they are married, and he kind of lays out the um, actions and habits one should practice and says that if your marriage is like this, uh, your perfection will rival the holiest of saints. And so it's it's even repeated there in, you know, the minds of the clergy that devoting yourself to a woman and devoting yourself to God aren't necessarily the same thing, but will be held in the same esteem because it's a defense of a higher nature of being. Um, if you are doing it in a proper understanding, not just through a mindless dogma or a, an, infer- an infernal lust. Right. Um, if you have the proper orientation behind yourself in committing yourself to either one or both at the same time, which is probably preferable, then you're, you're on a good path. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, because the, the, the devotion to the woman is kind of the vehicle that drives your devotion to God in a sense and devotion to that that participation in the higher form of being. So, you know, in a sense your the your marriage is a reflection of yourself and the devotion to your your marriage and your um your faithfulness to the church kind of have the same characteristic because it is it is the same like you said it's not the same type of devotion but it's the same essence of devotion. It's the same um attitude that you need to have towards either one of them and like you said not a blind um a blind adherence to dogma but really a uh, a deeper um sort of understanding that of the relationship that you have with your wife and with the with the church and, and therefore with god that is true um, and it's a two-way street because uh the woman in the relationship has to adhere to the higher aspects of damehood like we've mentioned before and in previous episodes and that's a whole uh, deeper dive that Evola will get into and that we will get into much further down the line but it's just a, a point to keep in mind for now too that it, it was definitely not just on the man's um, impetus to do everything it, it was very uh, balanced in a sense between the two sexes yeah and it's interesting that uh, Evola doesn't include um, damehood here but I, I understand why he didn't because this was more you know uh, dedicated to the uh, the warrior idea of chivalry rather than the general masculine idea of chivalry, like peacetime chivalry or, or things like that. It was it, it was dedicated to the spiritual warrior idea of chivalry. And that's one thing that I think you have to kind of get used to when you read Evola is that he very much thinks of himself as the warrior caste. And then, you know, we stated in the last episode that 
he thinks that the warrior cast is the is like equal to the regal cast and so he very much holds the warrior cast and the warrior ideal in high esteem and i'm not saying that that's anything bad but i'm saying that i think he neglects a lot of the other ideals because of his emphasis on the warrior ideal he focused so much on that that he didn't um spend enough time emphasizing things that would normally need to be emphasized to get a more holistic understanding and one of those things i think is you know peacetime chivalry um non-warrior-like chivalry but just a general you know gentlemanliness uh that you would see from the common cast um you know uh and and as well as damehood or feminine uh, i think the the feminine um the feminine counterpart to all of these masculine archetypes as well he didn't he didn't seem to touch on too much which is i, I find interesting um i think maybe if he would have had a chance to he he would have but you know it is what it is um on the flip side though it was important for him to kind of point out the lack of that warrior spirit in many situations and in many um, figureheads of the church, especially earlier on, um, when it did come to the warrior aesthetic and warrior spirit of things. And he did so with many quotations from uh, various saints, apostles, and uh, even scripture itself on this, I don't want to say meek, nature about the uh doctrine but in a very reserved um uh avoidance of of violence or of uh a warlike mentality that is definitely reflected in many of uh, jesus sermons but then there's plenty of also evidence to i don't want to say necessarily contradict that but conflict with those conclusions that evola brought or got from the um his readings of christianity Although it is a issue in our modern time on how averse people are to any conflict or um, militaristic attitudes that one might take up, whether it be in their faith or just in combating the modern world. And that's something that I've seen in real life as well, which people have this dogmatic... Um, reaction to in in rejecting and it's a bit of a concern because of how domineering and warlike our adversaries are and i understand in not trying to just become what you seek to destroy but also not allowing yourself to be destroyed in the process as well and that's what i think a lot of christians and um, westerners in general seem to lack the understanding of yeah definitely um and i think that uh, in large part, oh man, there was something I was going to say. It was about your conversation with uh, with um, the one fellow you did from Bertaria not too long ago. You mentioned uh, something. Yes. Oh man, I, I completely forgot what it was. But yeah, in, in large part, the uh, the idea of of the church and of the um, I, it was the, it was the conflicting the conflicting ideas yeah so the idea of the church essentially is um it, it does have that not pacifist nature to it but that um that non-warlike i guess like you said meek there's there really is no word to describe it because it's staunch not staunch reservation yeah is best way i could put it yeah staunch reservation to uh or as i guess an aversion to any uh martial conflict it was evident in the middle ages as well and Ebola kind of points that out. I think that's why his aversion to Christianity is uh, is so strong with this, because Christianity it doesn't it doesn't conflict with the warrior principle, but it certainly suppresses the warrior principle in favor of the priestly principle, which is something that Ebola doesn't like. And I think he, in his youth, you know, he had a uh, kind of a, a rather dogmatic hatred towards Christianity for this reason. But later on, he goes on to uh, to rectify this, and um, he says here actually. So one of the examples, you remember, I gave that that example of uh, of Meister Eckhart. He uh, he gives an example as well um, about the fact that so Rene Guénon actually uh, said that uh, Christianity lost its initiatic and esoteric understanding with uh, the execution of the uh, Knights Templar, and after that there was no connection between the exoteric tradition and the esoteric um, form of that tradition. And so it's funny because Evola goes here, he says, 
The most characteristic case is that of the Knights Templar, which were ascetic warriors who gave up the pleasures of the world in order to pursue a discipline not practiced in the monasteries but on the battlefields, and who were animated by a faith consecrated more by blood and victory than by prayer. The Templars had their own secret initiation, the details of which, though they were portrayed by their accusers with blasphemous tinges, are very significant. Among other things, in a preliminary part of the ritual, the candidates to the highest degree of Templar initiation were supposed to reject the symbol of the cross and to acknowledge that Christ's doctrine did not lead to salvation. The Templars were also accused of engaging in secret dealings with the quote-unquote infidels and of celebrating wicked rites. These were just symbols, as it was declared repeatedly, though in vain, at the Templars' trial. In all probability, this was not a case of sacrilegious impiety, but of, not, but of acknowledgement of the inferior character of the exoteric tradition represented by devotional Christianity, an acknowledgement that was required in order for one to be elevated to higher forms of spirituality. So, this emphasizes that point. The Knights Templar and other initiatic orders that existed at the same time as the church, um, which did, you know, have that aura of heresy to them, were the proper forms of initiation which were linked to the church or to Christianity in that way. And once the once these were kind of snuffed out, Christianity the uh, Christianity did evolve into a lesser, simply and only exoteric form of itself. There was no longer any esoteric understanding. And when there was, it was limited to things like Freemasonry or, you know, Western esotericism or occultism in general. So there was that that was around the time where the disconnect became super apparent between what the what the West understood to be or I guess what the West practiced and I guess understood to be proper. Um and then there was a disconnect between that and the actual fundamental essence of what that propriety was a manifestation of and so it's funny that he brings that up here and he goes on to talk about other esoteric implications of christian tales such as like that of the grail and stuff like that but the reason i said earlier that evola was critical of this form of christianity and not christianity as a whole is because he ends the chapter by saying moreover it was thanks to this very deviation of the church from the main themes of primitive christianity that the middle ages uh, that the or that during the Middle Ages, Europe came to know the last image of a world that in many aspects was of a traditional type. And I'd actually say he's very much right about that, because once this deviation did occur, you know, you did see more and more the the uh, themes that uh, constitute degeneracy and decay kind of set in. After It was after this, you know, initial split between the exoteric and the esoteric. It was the loss of understanding of that esoteric tradition. And then through that loss, there was a lack of individuals who were able to uphold society through that um, understanding and uh, that leads to kind of a type of spiraling degeneration of the exoteric tradition itself and then it allows for misunderstandings misrepresentations and on, on all of that other stuff to to pop up in its stead does, does that kind of make sense yeah and it actually brings per segue into next chapter uh the doctrine of the castes because he goes into a little further in the chapter the degeneration of those um sort of noble rights and in what you were just explaining uh in the nobility and the um how do you, do you say the uh the regal houses of europe as time progressed uh shedding this spiritual and um and metaphysical uh, aspiration to themselves and them deteriorating into these wholly political and material forces. And you can even see that in its sort of start with the persecution of things like the Templars, because that was more on a political grounds of, um, you know, I forget which king it was in France that saw the Templars as a political threat more than anything and Philip, used all the justifications. It might have been. Um and he used these arguments of heresy as justifications to disband and persecute the Templars, because as we know, or as we may not, um, depending on how well-read you are of the Templars, uh, many of them were very devout in uh, their adherence to Christianity and into the teachings of uh, Jesus Christ and um, their prayers in the battlefield collectively before they went in 
but they had this very adherent warrior mentality about them that did show way more than their uh, prescriptions to church doctrine. Um, and so it was easy to kind of cast them as a sort of uh, figure to persecute uh, because of the more political nature of things going on in the nobility of Europe at the time and their old guard mentalities of a proper caste system and the spiritual essence of the role they played in, in that society was the, then being pushed aside for various material, economic, and um, political reasons. Yeah, you're definitely right. And I, I do think that part of that was because of the, you know, um, the disconnect that came about from the, uh, the disconnect that came about from the exoteric to the esoteric traditions, you know, the initiatic lineages that were disconnected from the exoteric doctrine and all that, that spiraling that I mentioned before is a direct cause, I think, of, or maybe at least an indirect cause of that degeneration that went on in Europe that allowed the uh, political maneuverings to become a little bit more important than the archetypal. Because previously, you know, the, the archetypal nature and the higher mode of being was understood to be the most important thing, right? It, the um, devotion of society was supposed to be oriented towards this higher form of being, um, which we're kind of going to get at in this chapter with the with the caste system. Um, but around that time, you know, it se we seem to be seeing more and more the political maneuverings take greater precedence than the. I don't want to say ideological because that's not the right, the right word, but in a sense the loyalty to tradition, the adherence to tradition, the, I guess the emphasis of the tradition in society, that, that becomes less and less, and the political maneuverings become more and more prominent. And you can see that because after the Templar uh, fiasco, the whole, um, I would say it's about 100 years, and then uh, Machiavelli comes out with his writings, maybe it's, a, maybe it's 150 or 200 years, but still it's, you know, in very close proximity to Machiavelli's, uh, Machiavelli's writings, who, you know, was more concerned with the political principle than the religious principle. So we're starting to see this uh, degeneration go from, you know how I say we have that ordering of society where it's the religious principle then feeds into that political principle, which feeds into that economics, uh, that economic principle. We start to see this shift from the religious principle to the political principle right around this time. And I think that the Templar uh, uh, investigation or, or, you know, um, stamping them out, I guess, was probably the, not the first, but the biggest catalyzing event that set us down that path. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're into the chapter of the doctrine of the castes now. And like I said, I think that this is probably one of the most important chapters of the book. Like I said, if not the most important chapter, because the caste system is one of the most important aspects of the traditional society, even more important than the political organization, because that can come about subsequent to caste, but caste can't come about subsequent to political organization. And essentially, what caste is, well, I mean, if you, if you don't know what caste is this deep into our videos, I applaud you, but, you know, just to, <laughs> <laughs> just to get it out there, <laughs> um, essentially what caste is, is the manifestation of a given function of reality through various subgroups in a society. Right? So you take society as a whole, and then you divide it up by, you know, which certain groups pertain to which functions, such as the priest caste attending to the priestly duties, the warrior caste attending to martial duties, the common caste being the kind of like the bread and butter of society. You know, you have the merchant caste exercising the economic function and, and so on. So these and then these functions and their corresponding groups are arranged hierarchically in order of I don't want to say importance because importance isn't the right word here. But ascendance, I yeah, think, is a better. Yeah, they're, and yeah, they're, they're transcendence or, or ascendance. Yes, uh, and the thing is, you know, we've talked about this before. When you're when examining any one specific society's implementation of caste, um, or no, I'm I'm sorry. When you, I guess, when you talk about the uh, universal idea of caste, so not examining specific society's idea of caste, um, but rather you're examining the essence of the caste system in general. There are no strict number of castes that societies have to be divided up into. And that's what I think Evola, Genon, and you know, really all of their pupils and, and spiritual successors get wrong, is that they have this rigid adherence to there being a strict number of castes, which would be four, 
and that number comes from the most rigid implementation of the caste system in India. However, uh, universally speaking, I think the caste system isn't that rigid. You know, we've talked about it before. There could be dozens of castes, or there could be as little as two, you know, depending on circumstance and how you view it. And the essence of it really isn't as rigid as the substance of it. However, when the substance is considered strict adherence to caste, you know, however many there may be, that that's that becomes extremely important. And so the general idea in traditional society is that one is born with a certain disposition and certain preordainments that qualify them for this or that caste. And usually that caste has some type of initiation into it, and then they are uh, initiated into that caste. Um, or, you know, a subgroup of that caste, like a chivalric order, for instance, being a subgroup of the warrior caste. And then they assume the duties and the archetypal image of that caste. And Evola mentions something extremely important right at the beginning, um, or maybe a page in, but he says, uh, let's see. What upsets modern sensitivity the most about the caste system is the law of heredity and preclusion. It seems unfair that fate may seal at one's birth, one's social status, and predetermine the type of activity to which a man will consecrate the rest of his life, and which he will not be able to abandon, not even in order to pursue an inferior one, lest he become an outcast and a pariah shunned by everybody. When seen against the background of the traditional view of life, however, these difficulties are overcome. The closed caste system was based on two fundamental principles. The first principle consisted of the fact that traditional man considered everything visible and worldly as the mere effects of causes of a higher order. Thus, for example, to be born according to this or that condition, as a man or a woman, or in one caste rather than and in another, or in one race instead of another, and to be endowed with specific talents and dispositions, was not regarded as pure chance. All of these circumstances were explained by traditional man as corresponding to the nature of the principle embodied in an empirical self, whether willed or already present, such as one of the aspects of the Hindu doctrine of, Kar uh, Hindu doctrine of karma, and he goes on to talk a little bit about that. But in a sense, the caste system is just another example of that idea that physical reality is just a symbol of higher metaphysical principles that need to interact with one another. So what modern folks need to understand is, again, that we are we are only the manifestations of composite principles. And the reason that there are so many different people is because there are that many unique compositions of various principles that trace back to different levels and degrees. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the caste system is a prime example of some people possessing a traceability back to a more primordial and a more fundamental principle than others. And that's just kind of the way it is. And then, you know, uh, viewed as like it was in traditional society in this way, the caste system becomes a symbol of justice because it means that all is as it needs to be. And Evola furthers this point by saying, um, let's see here. I had a, uh, I had it written down. Literally just lost the page I was on. I apologize. Um, let's see. I can take it from there if you need. Sure. Let me uh, look for the, the page and, and go ahead. Going off of what Vincent was saying, though, is um, that Evelyn does bring up many points on the uh, spiritual nature of the cast, going into not just the overarching, uh, you know, machina of society, but of the smaller components there within. And he even brings up uh, later into the chapter how anyone's singular profession could be viewed as an art and then justifies this with quotations from um, Martin Luther, uh, who was going off of the work of Thomas Aquinas, uh, saying that to jump around for economic reasons or to improve one's uh, position in society uh, in or by virtue of one's um, job or, or some other type of work uh, is to go against God's plan because God has a set system for you to work within and he imbued you with a certain um certain characteristic of skills and kind of preset functions that you were pre predisposed to and to follow through with and to be good at because that is the function in which you play in um your existence and that's not to say you are trapped into some predestination but to acquiesce yourself in a certain way by 
totally enveloping uh, what it is you're going to be best at. And it's kind of finding your truest nature in and of itself, um, given the complete and utter uh, freedom you have in the world to all the choices you can make. You can make the incorrect choices um, or the very best ones, uh, given how you're suited for your life in this world. And that goes from, you know, the farmer working his land to the guild member to uh, even anyone today. I can take myself an ex as an example, being a welder and um, doing the work I do and uh, laying down weldmen in uh, different positions and for uh, different structures. The better I get at laying down those beads and, and you know, fusing things together, the better I feel in that position because I've dedicated myself to this as more or less an art and seeing the people I work with that have been doing this for decades at a time, they do make it look like an art that there's a certain level of beauty in, you know, the craftsmanship they have um, that more or less won't be seen by the average person, but still has the pride and dedication there to the job that they are fulfilling. And you can't say that about many professions in the modern world anymore because it is so vacuous of any higher nature to it. And these are things we're welding on that will most likely outlive us. Uh, right now I'm um, doing projects for uh, industrial bridges and um, commuter bridges for uh, trains. And that's something that is necessary for the uh, components of society to keep moving. And this higher nature of caste isn't the ghost in the machine, but it's rather the spirit that brought about the machine to be built in the first place, and that machine being society altogether. But what gets lost, as you know, um, we mentioned the nobility and other aspects of society from that point on after the Templars being persecuted, losing this air of... Uh, spirituality guiding them in their their positions that artfulness and direction was lost as well and so now it's become a very mechanized materialized uh, machina like i've said that looks more like this this automaton just going on and, and churning on just for the sake of doing so and not for any higher purpose and that's why people are so demoralized and hate their jobs and you know have so many other complaints in uh, modernity um, and then, you know, seek satisfaction or gratification from material vices to distract themselves from the depravity of the world they uh, see because there is no higher spiritual essence in what they do for a living or what they can find outside of work as well because so many people are disconnected from uh, any worldly institution of, you know, the church or the temple as Evola states in these chapters as well. Um, and it keeps going, uh, from there. Yeah, definitely. Um, I did find the, uh, the passage I was looking for too. Um, he says that once the sense of personality is not focused on the ephemeral principle of human individuality, which is destined to leave behind it, nothing but a shadow at death. All this seems very natural and evident. It is true that much can be achieved in a lifetime. But achievements mean absolutely nothing from a higher point of view, from a point of view that knows that the progressive decay of the organism will eventually push, push one into nothingness, when they do not actualize the pre-existing will that is the reason for a specific birth. Such a prenatal, will, uh, such a prenatal, prenatal will cannot be easily altered by a temporary and arbitrary decision taken at a given point of one's earthly journey. So, the only one true accomplishment that matters for a person in a spiritual sense is to adhere to their archetypal nature. And so this is important because it maintains the integrity of the society and of the tradition of the right, or the R-I-T-E, the right. And therefore it maintains the integrity of reality because understood in this sense, reality is 100% absolute, which means that reality itself is archetypal. And Evola talks about the self in this way that I described it before. He says... Uh, once this is understood, the necessity of the castes will become clear. The only quote-unquote self modern man knows and is willing to acknowledge is the empirical self that begins at birth and is more or less extinguished at death. Everything is reduced to him, or everything is reduced by him to the mere human individual sense, uh, 
the mere human individual, since in him all prior recollections have disappeared. Thus we witness the disappearance of both the possibility of establishing contact with those forces which uh, the, the forces of which a given birth is just the effect, and the possibility of rejoining that non-human element in man, which, being situated before birth, is also beyond death. This element constitutes the place for everything that may eventually be realized beyond death itself and is the principle of an incomparable sense of security. This gets mm -hmm. back again to the idea of participation in higher and more universal states of being. And the caste system is one example of that. We've talked about it before, but humans have a hard time comprehending participation in any state of being higher than our own because we are each individual manifestations of different compositions. And so we're rather autonomous. But the nature of these compositions themselves is already inferior to the mode of being that we could be participating in if we were to shed off some of these lesser and lower principles and reconnect with certain singular individual principles that exist outside of the temporal dimension. So I gave the analogy of a tank of water. Uh, I think, I, I don't know when I did this, but I think it was uh, last episode actually, maybe. I gave the analogy of a tank of water being used and I think the analogy works here too. Uh, imagine that essentially there is one tank of pure water, and you use that water to fill a number of different cups. And each of these cups might look different and require a different amount of water. And now imagine that in addition to the water, you put in some type of admixture into each of the cups. And the admixture is unique for each cup. Some might, you know, you might have salt and sugar, you might have salt and dirt, some might have dirt and oil or whatever. But at the end, you get different cups that are compositions of different materials, yet they all share that same initial water and those cups those cups represent different people of the same caste and the purpose of initiation is to filter out all of the different substances within the water uh so that it can get back so that it can all then be poured back into the initial tank and so you see the you see the different compositions of the cups and the mixtures of different substances those were only uh, those were only uh those were the only thing which provided any sense of individuality to the water. And that, indivi that individuality is how we perceive ourselves in the here and now. And then again, initiation is that filtering process of purification. And then in the end, what we're left with is that archetype of being a manifestation of the pure water and to then be absorbed back into that larger body of water. But we can't perceive what it's like to participate in such a thing until we're already there. That's the purpose of initiation and caste and these other elements. And I actually think that it's very well described by Plato's cave analogy. Uh, you know, as rudimentary as it is in contemporary philosophy, it really is that because the cave represents participate. Or um, sorry, leaving the cave represents participation in some type of higher spirituality. But you cannot convey the perception of that higher spirituality to someone of who has not yet been initiated. And that's what I think uh, the caste system represents here. Uh, I heard you were going to say something before I went on, so. I was agreeing just for the most part with the, mm -hmm. um, but I did have a couple other things to add as well in, in compliment to what you're saying. And I guess to start off, the ironic um, and kind of tragic but funny aspect of Plato's Cave is that everyone thinks that they're the one leaving it to go come back and, and show everyone else that there's a world outside of the uh, the shadows being projected on the wall. Um, and the very stark reality to it is that very, very few people are the ones to actually leave the cave. Um, and people will radically convince themselves otherwise that, no, they know reality outside the, the walls of the cave. Um, even though they're still sitting in the darkness anyways. And who knows, maybe we're still sitting in the cave ourselves, but we're doing our best to try and, you know, find the light and find the way out. Uh, on top of all that, though, everything you're saying is, is 100% um, to the fact that uh, in modern society, it's not just a uh, transgression um, or uh, it's it's a there's a rejection of uh, not just the caste um, as we have it, but of so many other aspects of ourselves that are predetermined before we are really born. And Evola was arguing as well that the state of one's birth does not determine one's caste. It is their caste, you know, a priori to your birth that um, determines what 
you are born as. And that goes for any number of other things as well, going into the uh, bits and parts that make up the sum of you as a person. Yeah. And na- nowadays, uh, it is a constant force of rejection and transfiguration uh, against those things which you were predetermined to be, whether it be um, in your caste, in your um, sex, in your even species to some extent, uh, with uh, people in the transhumanist vision of uh, society or in the um, spheres of things like furries or whatever else, modern degeneracies and horrors that we have to look upon, there is this constant rejection of what we are innately and trying to become something other than um, ourselves. And it's all stemming from the same root of uh, uh, these, these issues spiritually that are kind of determined before we even step into our own consciousness you know it's funny because uh as you were talking uh evola actually does say exactly what you just said um he says uh it can be said oh for real he just he just spoke to you as i was talking oh yeah he definitely (laughs) 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 no but um no, he, he, How you phrase that? You, yeah. you see, Evola said to me while you were talking. He said exactly what you said. <laughs> um, no, he says uh, it can be said, therefore, that birth does not determine nature, but that nature determines birth. More specifically, a person is endowed with a certain spirit by virtue of being born in a given caste. But at the same time, one is born in a specific caste because one possesses transcendentally a given spirit. So it's kind of like what you were saying, where you know, you're not necessarily born into your caste to um, and then you're given your spirit that you have to adhere to. It's that you have your spirit before you are born into the cast, but then because you are born into the cast, you now have that spirit. It's, it's a constant, it's a constant uh, feedback loop. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it's, it really is the kind of the way in which reality communicates with itself. You know, it, it manifests these, this certain principle to exercise this certain function Um so that all other principles may exercise their function in tandem with it. And it's kind of the way that uh, reality works. That's what theology gets at. And so it's kind of an echo into infinity. Exactly. And the danger of deviating from that is, um, is pretty, um, let's see. Actually, he actually says later on. Yeah. He said, there's a whole other part of this chapter that details what happens if a person were to step out of the cast or to break the caste system. He says, uh, Let's see. Um, It is therefore clear why... I just lost it. Nice. Oh, I found it. Yeah, it is therefore clear why leaving one's cast and mixing casts, or even the rights, the duties, the morality, and the cults of each cast was considered a sacrilege that destroys the efficacy of every right and leads those who are guilty of it to hell. That is the realm of demonic influences that belong to the inferior nature. Ah, there it is. There it is. And the people guilty of crossing the caste line were considered the only impure beings in the entire hierarchy. They were pariahs or untouchables because they represented centers of psychic infection in the sense of an inner dissolution. So, he goes on to say that in India, only the people without a caste were considered outcasts. Which is kind of funny that it's, you know... uh, bit on the nose there (laughs) exactly um and they were shunned even by the lowest caste even if they had previously belonged to the highest caste on the contrary nobody felt humiliated by his own caste and even a sudra was as proud and as committed to his own caste as a brahmana of the highest station was to his so uh the sudra being the uh like the 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 lower common labor slave whatever you want to call it caste and the uh the brahmana the brahmana being that regal priestly warrior um ascetic type of uh, ascetic type of caste and which is it's it's kind of funny the reason for this again is not supposed to be considered oppression of the lesser caste by the greater ones but rather a certain manifestation of propriety that is exemplified by adhering to one's nature it's like uh for example it's like the wheel of a car suddenly decides that it wants to uh be conjoined to the engine or something like that or you know like the like the window suddenly wants to be on the wheel or something you know the window would break um yeah that's essentially and this what actually he's getting at okay oh, when sorry um i wanted to wait till you were finished but I, I just had a realization while i was reading that as well um 
No, no, I was essentially done. It's essentially, you know, one part trying to conjoin itself to some other part or trying to uh, exercise some other function that it, it just does not work. It will, it quite literally would break uh, society and would break the uh, the cyclic nature of history. But um, mm -hmm. go ahead. And to that point, uh, Evola does bring up um, Buddhism in that respect as well. And we don't typically think of Buddhism in this way, but Buddhism is a sort of radical uh deviation from that historical norm of you know spiritual transcendence and the caste systems and how we operate typically as um uh you know human societies go about but buddhism isn't heretical or sacrilegious in this sense uh in rejecting the caste system as it does it is a transcendence of that altogether and very similar to those who uh, look into things like the demiurge and the deterioration of things uh, in their uh, uh, the, the deterioration of reality and its physical nature as it is physical uh, at all. Um, Buddhism kind of goes beyond that as well in the looking at things even as high as gods themselves uh, playing a role in their own caste in the uh, theater of the real uh, in the theater of reality. And the whole point of it is to detach oneself from this physical world and transcend, uh, you know, caste entirely, not to reject the purpose of their uh, nature, that that a priori spirit that they were, that kind of predetermined them to be what they are, but to fully embrace it as they can beyond the limitations of the physical world. And that's something that Evola kind of hits on, um, but what may kind of be overlooked by so many people as well. And what is definitely a, I'd say a noble pursuit for some people um, in this world. It, it's definitely not a path that uh, everyone, uh, aside from a very, very small minority of people can actually even properly pursue uh, because of so many other distractions or deviations um, or you know predeterminations in one's own life to be on another path and so trying to follow that very radical sense of spiritual ascendance uh, might be a worse option for some um, even though it does sound like a pretty <laughs> I, I don't i don't want to demean the idea but a, a pretty nifty idea in um the pursuit of spirituality yeah definitely um and he, he kind of hits on that uh with this quote right here he says Every type of function and activity appeared equally as a point of departure for an elevation in a different and vertical, rather, excuse me, rather than horizontal sense, and not in the temporal, but in the spiritual order. In this regard, by being in their own caste, in faithfulness to their own caste and to their own nature, in obedience not to a general morality, but to their morality or to the morality of their own caste, everyone enjoyed the same dignity and the same purity as everybody else. This was true for a sudra as well as for a king. And this is kind of this kind of touch at the it touches at the heart of what you were saying, where in a sense this the you know spiritual ascension doesn't look the same for everybody, and a lot of I would say neo spiritualists and and um, religious groups try to level everybody to this same uh, type of spirituality, but really in traditional society it was understood that uh, spirituality was uh, different according to caste and according to all of, a, a hierarchy of different things, really. And this further establishes the point that castes are to be viewed as qualitatively equal and yet quantitatively and responsibly separate, as opposed to the modern egalitarianism of quantity. And uh, it should also be said that when it comes to women, the caste system is applied more loosely than it is to men. Very rarely you might find a woman with as rigid an adherence to a certain caste as a man would have and that's that's when you get you know the feminine equivalent ideas to things like chivalry, where you have damehood, and if it's taken to its extreme, you might have what Evola calls the civilization of the mother, which we'll get into in chapters also. Um, but really, it uh, really it's generally assumed that a woman shares either the same caste as her father if she's not married, and her husband if she is. And again, this varies from society to society. So, if there were to be a general rule, I would say the caste system is generally just looser on women than it is on men, and I've even heard some people say that femininity places women in a caste of their own, being that 
counterpart to the masculine principle, essentially filling all the necessary gaps by exercising their feminine function. But uh, that that's a whole other can of worms. But I, I do think that the uh, uh, it, it was interesting to hear that particular aspect that femininity might constitute its own caste because Evola goes on to detail later the difference between man and woman and um, the spiritual ascendance or the path to spiritual ascendance is also different from man to woman as well so it was interesting to note and uh, I think that's kind of it for the doctrine of the caste did you have anything else you want to touch on before we moved on to the next chapter I did have one other thing but uh, in the completion of your point there I, it slipped away from my mind Oh, I apologize. Yeah, that kind of uh, that kind of does summarize the uh, the the cast. Sorry, could you hear that? Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Um, and that, that kind of does summarize the uh, the chapter of the doctrine of the casts. I would say, like I said, this uh, this chapter is probably the most important uh, fundamental chapter to the book, and the reason for that is again because it it kind of gives the thesis of the traditional society because the the entire traditional society was built on the idea of castes because what a caste is could be understood relative to um a given circumstance so like i said you could have perhaps you know a dozen castes two dozen castes or you could have two depending on how you look at it is you know depending on how hyper specific you want your caste to be right it does the common caste include both the labor caste and the merchant caste or does it separate them does the labor caste include both um manual labor or uh and intellectual labor for like let's say um writing and things like that you know authors were generally perceived to be as very poor and lowly individuals themselves um you know, are there, are those two different castes? Are the intellectuals a different caste themselves? Is there is there a certain caste for philosophers? Do the police um, is the police force differentiated from the warrior caste, and in what way do they not exercise? So you know, caste is is a very relative term, but that's the importance of it is that each of them are like a specific function to a given body. And in the beginning of the chapter, funny enough, he actually uh, mentions the uh, idea that. Um, he says at the uh, the the Indo Aryan system was visibly inspired by the hierarchy of the various functions found in physical organisms animated by the spirit. He says at the lower level you have the uh, impersonal energies of matter and mere vitality, which is you know regulating the functions of metabolism and stuff like that. These functions are in turn regulated by the will, which moves and directs the body. And finally, we assume the soul to be the center, which is the sovereign power and the light of the entire organism. So you would have the caste system be exemplified by something like that. You would have the lower labor caste kind of um, literally building society up from the ground. And then you would have that middle management class that, that uh, kind of directs but doesn't necessarily uh, comprehend the full scope of what it is that they're directing. And then you have at the top the... Uh, the, the orchestrators who do understand both the esoteric and exoteric implications of their tradition plus the uh, plus possess the capability to orchestrate that in, in wider society to direct that whole um, that whole thing so the cast like I said very important chapter um, the next one we're dealing with is uh, it is called professional, professional Asso associations yep. and the arts of slavery yep or in the arts semicolon uh, comma, slavery yeah it's it's professional associations and the arts semicolon slavery and this chapter is it kind of plays on what i was saying earlier when i was talking about the idea of initiation being a universal thing and when you are accepted into a initiatic tradition you kind of assume the identity of that uh tradition and shed off all of your temporal qualities and attributes and become part of this universal order of people who are also within this lineage uh, professional associations and the arts slavery gets at that in the occupational and vocational sense um, especially in regards to the sciences um, so he starts off by saying uh, when viewed as a relationship between potentiality and act hierarchy allowed the same motif established at the top to be reproduced in the activities of different castes or social organisms though on the plane of different paths of fulfillment uh, more or less spiritual he says he goes on to say, in the domain of knowledge, the presupposition of 
or the presupposition was of a system of sciences fundamentally different in their premises and methodologies from modern ones. Every modern profane science corresponds to, or corresponds in the world of tradition to a sacred science that had an organic, qualitative character and considered nature as a whole in a hierarchy of degrees of reality and forms of experience in which the form connected to the physical senses is just one among others. And this is one thing we need to take a uh, big note of because Rene Guénon's uh, Reign of Quantity and the Sign of the Times did the exact same thing. What Evel is getting at here is the modern sciences in contrast to the traditional sciences, which were understood to be completely different and had a completely different goal. So we have to remember that in traditional society, the goal, again, was to orient yourself towards that higher state of being, and then along those lines to understand what it is like, or under, to understand that higher state of being itself, essentially, and uh, to then experience what it is like and to pass on that knowledge to the next generation. So... The entire traditional society was dedicated towards higher states of being and uh, spiritual ascension and transcendence and all of that. And so this is no less true for the sciences and for the vocational practices that came about in the traditional society. So you would think of, uh, let's say, uh, actually he says here, he, he, he mentions alchemy and uh, you know how he says that... Um, and astrology. Yeah, astrology. Alchemy and astrology were in no way... Uh, just um, archaic or previous versions of, you know, modern astrology or astronomy or um, modern chemistry, but they actually had a significant, uh, a significantly superior nature to them, because what they were trying to discover was qualitatively superior to what it is that modern sciences are trying to discover. And what Rene Guénon gets at in his book is essentially the same thing. He's uh, the in, the thesis for traditionalism is that in the world of tradition, there is no theory because there is only knowledge, and so the only way to attain higher knowledge is to um, essentially scale the ladder from what is lower to what's higher, and to achieve that higher point of knowledge by connecting various elements, whether that be through um, uh, astrology being one of those things, which is essentially a symbol of uh, divine will and not necessarily a determiner in itself, or you know, chemistry or or, or uh, sorry, alchemy or masonry. Freemasons is a, is another one, but all of these things were dedicated to getting some type of higher form of knowledge, and modern sciences are the exact opposite of that. Where we are not trying to get a higher form of knowledge, we are trying to understand physical bodies more, which is oriented in the wrong direction. It might bring about a certain type of empirical or factual understanding of physical reality, but beyond that, it doesn't give us any sense of purpose or uh, holistic unity or transcendence that we're looking for in these types of sciences. And so along with these different types of sciences, we get uh, things that, uh, in a sense, each science gets their own deity, right? So you would have, uh, uh, especially in traditional societies, you would have things like um, or I guess non-Christian societies, you would have things like um, local gods who might consecrate a city and then watch over a city. You might have artisan guilds or, or things like that who have their own mythologies to them. And uh, this carried on into the medieval society as well with uh, the Hermetic society having figures like Hermes Trismegistus being a um, major figurehead in their, essentially their, their ideological doctrine, which went along with the science. And... Um, the uh, Freemasons having their own mythology. Uh, those are just two big examples, but, you know, each... I mean, the church does do this as well, though, in the canonization and application of... Um, uh, why did I just forget the word? Um, like the saints? saints. Yeah. Yes. Uh, patron saints. There we oh, go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Um so yeah, I guess I guess you are right. I did I did kind of gloss over that. That is true. Um, yeah. So each each tradition is under or each vocational tradition, uh, lowercase t, is understood to have its own patron, its own mythology, and in the doctrine of the castes chapter, Evola said that each person was supposed to adhere by their own by the morality of their own caste rather than to a general morality. And this is true even with vocation. Each vocation had its own morality. Each um, 
practice had its own way of life associated with it. So if you were a if you were an alchemist, for example, you took the code of the alchemist in the same way that the knight would take the code of chivalry to be of utmost importance. And contrast that with modern profane sciences and, and modern bodies, uh, modern companies, which are kind of the result of these older guilds and uh, spiritual traditions, and you get nothing of the sort. And so that's why I say this this uh, chapter carries on that theme of initiation from the original chapter that we began with, because in the Soul of Chivalry, we examined the relationship between the initiation of the knight and his acceptance into a universal order of knights that all shared his same morality and were part of his same caste. The same thing is true with the professions. Is it, it, When you are initiated into a profession, you are then uh, accepted by a universal body of uh, others who might share that same profession. You are given a master and a craft and a, a mission, really, to understand uh, implicitly and explicitly both yourself and reality and the relationship between the two and uh this was your life's work and so just like the caste system this initiation had gradual degrees into which you were uh um brought up and and promoted to and eventually you were the one to initiate the next person into this craft and this was kind of like i would say primitive education you remember we t i don't remember if we talked about i think we did we we, we made a podcast we yeah we made a podcast about how a person is introduced into society and professional associations have uh, the, the this chapter deals with what that is like. I think, in a sense, um, mm -hmm. being introduced. And if I may, before we go uh, deeper into the chapter, I just wanted to emphasize sure. that previous point you made with the um, you know uh, guiding forces of the spiritual spiritual ethos and you know those ethical and moral guidelines that any of these um, disciplines. The, the traditions of these disciplines would adhere to and the contrast to modern society, especially in the sciences that do not have those guidelines and uh, fail safes and full stops. Uh, because in things like alchemy, there were certain ethical lines that you just did not cross. Um, and considering things like homunculi, which, you know, is just a, a fairy tale considered by most today. And, in, in, you know, the alchemy, chemical components creating um, these sprites or pygmy-like uh, monstrosities, but we now see those manifesting in our modern sciences and in various uh, forms of uh, gene therapy or in um, other biological monstrosities like uh, stem cells from rats being used to um, become the brains of uh, robots and, you know, um, AI learning algorithms and things like that, uh, or going on further into the more human aspect of things in the uh, progression of transgenderism or um, whatever other medical profanity that's going on that clearly and continuously go well beyond those ethical uh, guidelines that otherwise would be uh, enforced to stop if we have these more spiritual um, patronages like, you know, the saints or these other mythological figures uh, to prevent us from doing so and adhering uh, to those restraints. Otherwise, things get out of hand very quickly. And we see that in all aspects of uh, the technocratization of uh, society. And that's not to blame technology in its own right, because it, it's they're inanimate things. It's our, it's use, our use of, of them. them. Yeah, yeah, and the narratives that come about from those uh, theories and from those technologies and from these um, unrestrained practices of the sciences and, and medicine and of any other disciplinary field we see now to be used as a cudgel in. Um, beating the rest of society to go along with otherwise outlandish absurdities like you know the whole transsexual thing or uh, the, the climate crisis stuff or just name any one of your major headline news stories that the uh, cult of scientism uses to scare or otherwise manipulate the general populace into going along with for whatever our um, technologarchy wants us to um, do 
uh, with their plans in mind. Yeah, definitely. And that's the um, that's essentially what we we're getting at here. Um, so uh, just just to put it in Avola's words, he says, "In reality, the caste system did not only, or in the caste system, not only did every profession or trade correspond to a vocation." Hence the double meaning preserved in the English term calling, which is funny because vocation, you know, to vocalize, they both have the same root word. Um, not only was there something to be found in every product as a crystallized tradition that could be activated by a free and personal activity and by an incomparable skill, not only were the dispositions de developed in the exercise of a trade and acknowledged by the social organism transmitted through the blood as a congenital and uh, uh, congenital and deep attitudes, but th but something else was present as well, namely the transmission, if not the real initiation, of at least an inner tradition of the art was preserved as a sacred and secret thing, even though it was partly visible in the several details and rulers, which symbolical and relig religious elements that were displayed but in the traditional guilds, um, whether Eastern, Mexican, Roman, medieval, and so on. Being introduced to the secrets of an art did not correspond to the mere empirical or rational teachings of modern man. In, the do in this domain, certain cognitions were credited with a non-human origin, an idea expressed in a symbolic form by the traditions concerning the gods or demons or the heroes, Baldur, Hermes, Vulcan, Prometheus, who originally initiated men into these arts. So, uh, again, Baldur, Hermes, Vulcan, Prometheus... Um, Hermes is a big one because there's uh, two different types depending on, on whether you're considering Hermes Trismegistus or not. You have the uh, and it, the um, the uh, Knights Templar having their own sort of patron, either saint or deity or, or at least patron ideal that, that goes along with them in this in this primitive sense, um, being the first of these of these um, craftsmen that came about at the time. So your your profession does go back to a certain deity uh, who is the first of this profession so that there's a first alchemist and this is this myth, uh, mythologized figure that goes along with the founding of this uh, vocation and you know there is a first stonemason that goes along with the, the founding of this vocation and and so on and um that's essentially what the what the differentiating factor between modern institutions and previous institutions are is this ideal of uh or is this higher ideal of a um spiritual authority guiding the craft as it were through various stages of um technologization so you know um it's essentially you know, we see this commonly i think in the islamic golden era as well where islam and science were very much intertwined um technological progression and the religious element were very much intertwined this is kind of that same idea you have the philosophic side of the tradition the um mythological and religious and spiritual side of the tradition is almost more important than the uh manifestation of the tradition itself or the modes or methods through which that tradition enacts itself whether that be through building or through uh, scientific research or through um you could you could even apply it to today if if we were to make computers today there would be or if we were in a, a traditional society today and we were to have computers there would be a first you know computer maker you know what i mean it's it's like that um the first programmer type the first programmer stuff. exactly exactly um and in contrast to that today what we have is a worship of people who uh, usually come about of the common caste who then turn this profane type of knowledge into some type of economic empire and then um, they are deified by the people people like uh, Bill Gates or Elon Musk or um, Bill Nye Dr. Fauci yep all, all of them take your pick yeah so it, in a sense instead of having these mythologized figures who who adhered to a traditional spiritual uh not only morality but uh a lifestyle themselves being the first of this tradition what you now have is a very loosely connected um, array of different vocations that have no morality whatsoever and only look up to individual people who in fact did exist and uh, i think before i think in previous chapters we talked about the importance of not 
using history as your your reference point but using mythology as your your reference point instead because these are things that are more transcendent and real and so that's the problem mm-hmm. with uh that's that's the disconnect between this and that and you know this is especially true in the arts as well and uh to kind of be a bit ironic in that sense uh, Kanye West recently because of all of his controversies um had an interview with Lex Friedman where he was making the same point on to not use history as the reference point because of his own experience in seeing how things he witnessed himself would be completely contrary to what the news reports it on the very next day. So how can he trust whatever uh, historians or documentations say about historical events from thousands of years in the past? And he had a much more nuanced and transcendent um, perspective on these things in this vision for people, not just of his own, you know, ethnic racial makeup, but of all peoples that he's seems to be working through himself, not just on um, a material sense, but on the spiritual journey that we've seen him, uh, at least through the public eye, been going through. And it's to have it's difficult to try to avoid the deification of um, celebrity figures. I think Kanye West, though, is a genuine exception in the rule for most all of these things because he is someone who just, I don't know, he just is the exception. It is, yeah. And it, it's a whole can of worms that we might get into in another time, but just keep in mind that example there for the moment. But um, the broader point is not just in the sciences, Uh, where all these disciplines are true, but in the arts as well, which is kind of the namesake of this chapter, and the Dionysian figures that are the cultural cornerstones of our society. And Evola even makes this point in the chapter as well, looking at things from uh, authors' and writers' perspectives, especially in the Middle Ages, on how there were so many uh, transcendent works that started to explode. And... um, change in their approaches in a truly creative sense on an individualistic and group level for, you know, epics, poetry, uh, sagas, and uh, various mythologies, even going down to, you know, local fairy tales, but getting to that sense of the true nature of things in this uh, pseudo-entertainment fashion, Um, but that has a higher calling to it in this uh, Dionysian sense of art. much like how Nietzsche would look at someone like, um, oh, who's that composer that he liked so much? Uh, I'm I'm I hitting myself for not remembering. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hating myself for not remembering the uh, the composer, but uh, you know, German composer of, of the late nineteenth century. I'm pretty sure he's the one that penned Flight of the Valkyries. So you'll know who I'm I'm talking about if you can look that up. Um, sorry, everyone. <laughs> but uh, people like that, that uh, kind of embody this sense of true art and, and the um, being able to demonstrate different aspects of a reality in a truly creative and unique way that you wouldn't typically experience through your normal senses or that you'd have to reinterpret from a different perspective of your senses. Kind of like uh, Vivaldi, which is another composer, and his very famous um, uh, epic uh, orchestra of the Four Seasons. And, you know, there's the very famous one with the, the very fast violin, but that's only one movement of the 12 that he has that goes through all four seasons. And, you know, each movement being a different month throughout the year, that brings on a new body of the work, but it, it very artfully and, and very um, accurately represents these seasons and these months and, and the changes that we experience throughout a year, um, but all through the composition of an orchestra. And it's something that very few people could even try to replicate, let alone come up with uh, completely originally on their own. And so it's it's this deterioration as well that we see with the profanity in um, almost a mockery of what traditionally we had as art and of the um, creative lens of society 
in composing these myths and narratives and um, musics and paintings and whatever other medium we have, whereas now we have the traditions um, that we hold sacred being defiled by, you know, characters like Lizzo playing, um, what is it, James Madison's uh, Crystal Flute? Who, mm. who was the Founding Father's Crystal Flute? One of, one of them. Yeah. Um, but that, that was just a recent thing uh, that that happened as well. And everyone was up in arms about that because it's such a obvious disrespect and, and you know, parading of the conquering of our founding fathers or the, the founding myth of, you know, the United States in that display. Um, but there's a, a deeper sort of deterioration in that sense too, beyond just the relative aspect of the uh, American narrative. Yeah. And it's funny because, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the American founding fathers are very much mythologized. And I think it's good to, it's funny because it goes back on, on what I was saying a little bit ago, but it's good to mythologize figureheads that did a, that made certain steps um, of positive progress throughout a human society. So essentially the establishers of society, which is like the founding fathers, it's good to mythologize them in a sense, and, and I wouldn't say deify them, but, you know, at least canonize them in a, in a certain type of colloquial mythology that um, allows people to understand them as essences rather than as people, because it really does add to the substance of a society when they draw from that mythology and mythos as, uh, or for their substantial day-to-day -day lives and their, their social morality. And America did so for, you know, quite a few years, quite a, quite a long period of time. And that's what kept it so intact until, you know, the founding myth became a little bit less important in the face of economic crisis and, and uh, political endeavors and all of that. So in the same way that the medieval world fell, uh, you know, centuries prior, America kind of went through that same process, only a little bit expedited because the technology and, and social circumstances at the time just, you know, does that to, uh, uh, after over a given period of time it just you know it, it goes not faster not even that but just being on the uh the decay of the spiritual system that we're in as a um you know as yeah. this realm we exist in is so everything's kind of just getting exposited as you know new empires rise and fall even more quickly because the fabric of our age is you know getting onto the end of that Kali Yuga and so things are just kind of quickly snapping up to um the ruins that we we soon may be standing amongst yeah and so it's funny when you when you look at that when you look at that type of decay and uh going back to the the heart of the chapter when you look at the decay of certain institutions of you know whether that be uh i guess certain vocational or occupational institutions when you look at the primordial or proper ideal of them uh and then you you contrast that with the modern manifestation of them you get a certain type of uh you you really start to see the effects of what that orientation does over a long period of time to wider society and evola actually makes this comparison um by using slavery as the as the vehicle for this comparison he says uh when the inner strength of a fides which is faithfulness or, or fidelity um is no longer present then every activity is defined according to its purely material aspect also, equally worthy paths are replaced with an effect-driven differentiation dictated by the type of activity being performed. Hence, the sense of intermediary forms of social organization, such as ancient slavery. As paradoxical as it may first appear in the context of those civilizations that largely employed the institution of slavery, it was work that characterized the condition of a slave, and not vice versa. In other words, when the activity in the lower strata of the social hierarchy was no longer supported by a spiritual meaning, and when instead of an action there was only work, then the material criterion was destined to take over, and those activities related to matter and connected to the material needs of life were destined to appear as degrading and as unworthy of any free human being. Therefore, work became to be seen as something that only a slave would engage in, and became almost a sentence. Likewise, the only dharma possible for a slave was work. The ancient world did not despise labor because it practiced slavery and because those who worked were slaves. On the contrary, since it despised labor, it despised the slave. 
and since those who worked could not be anything but slaves, the traditional world willed slavery into being, and it differentiated, instituted, and, reg and regulated into a separate social class, the mass of people whose way of being could only be expressed through work. So, in a sense, the traditional society, um, after the uh, institution of this um, this labor caste, it, it essentially instituted its own caste. It basically created the slave caste. And so, um, this was a pretty much a historic development, and one of the things that could have led to, um, whether it be... Uh, it could be a, a, a factor, a contributing factor in the decay of society on the way to the Kali Yuga, is what I'm saying. But it's funny to note because um, that's what he will say about the traditional form of slavery and the slave caste. And then he um, he then goes on to say, he, he goes on to differentiate it with modern forms of slavery, which I think is interesting as well. He says, if the modern world has disapproved of the injustice of the caste system, it has stigmatized much more vibrantly those ancient civilizations that, has practiced, that have practiced slavery. Recent times boast of having championed the principle of human dignity. This too is mere rhetoric. Let us set aside the fact that Europeans reintroduced and maintained slavery up to the 19th century in their overseas colonies in such heinous forms as to be rarely found in the ancient world. What should be emphasized that if there ever was a civilization of slaves on a grand scale, the one in which we are living is it. No traditional civilization ever saw such great masses of people condemned to perform shallow, impersonal, automatic jobs. In the contemporary slave system, the counterparts of figures such as lords or enlightened rulers are nowhere to be found. This slavery is imposed subtly through the tyranny of the economic factor and through the absurd structures of a more or less collectivized society. And since the modern view of life in its materialism has taken away from the single individual any possibility of bestowing on his destiny a transfiguring element and seeing in it a sign and a symbol, contemporary slavery should therefore be reckoned as one of the gloomiest and most desperate kinds of all times. So, it's funny how he will talk about the, uh, the traditional society, as it were, in a sense creating the slave caste, but then also talking about how the, um, how modern society will has in a sense um, created the worst form of slavery as as it has ever existed, and so mm -hmm. uh, it it obscures I think how we look at caste in general and how we looked at the the common caste in particular because on the one hand you can in a sense separate you know the the patrician caste from the the uh, the common caste or you know the the initiated from the uninitiated and the greater from the lesser and all of that, but what really constitutes the common caste right now, I think, is what we need to be focused on because this um, idea. This is one of the things that I wanted to uh, that I wanted to touch upon previously as well. Um, let me see if I can't uh, find it in my notes. Let's see. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, so yeah, we have to we have to participate uh, or we have to differentiate this type of participation in the archetype of an idea. And uh, we have to differentiate that from a leveling type of collectivism, which lowers the idea of personhood to the most relative shared attribute rather than the highest qualitative one. And uh, Evola talks about this later in a few ways, but um, I just kind of want to just establish it here because assuming the, um, the uh, basically assuming the identity of a universal and super regional archetype is completely different from humanistic egalitarian collectivism, which makes the assumption that all people can share in a single group identity, whether that be of a nationalistic type or a socialistic type, without any differentiating factors in between them, such as caste or things like that. And essentially, this is again another example of the difference between that greater and lesser type of being. And you could say collectivism is the uninitiated and anti universal archetypalism and a lesser man's comprehension of what should be understood as something akin to the caste system. And mm. when you examine that type of, um, or when you examine this understanding of archetypalism and things like that, the labor caste is at the forefront of this because they represent on the one hand an adherence to spiritual authority through work. And on the other hand, they um, embody in a sense, a complete deviation from spiritualism in general because their life is um, or their um, actualization can only be found in material labor. Does that make sense? Yeah, entirely. And it, I guess the last grand point that I want to go off of going back to um, 
what you were quoting with Epilogue and explaining on his uh, point of slavery is that I was very much on that same train of thought years ago before I'd ever even heard of Evola and uh, or even e gotten out of my um, very materialist relative uh, conception of the world as a teenager. I actually and, think, um, sorry to interrupt, but I actually think that this okay. worldview is shared by the left. The, the um, here, here's my contest to that because I brought up this exact argumentation, although not as well articulated as uh, Evola, because uh, of course I was 16 and um, contextualized in the public school system at the time. So there's only so much I could say and in my own sort of autistic ramblings and, and uh, you know, organization of my own mind can only do so much to do these points justice. But I did do my best to try and represent and ask the question of what is inherently wrong with the system of slavery as we had it previously, uh, as opposed to the systems of slavery we have now, um, which, you know, I, I brought up that, that we are in systems of slavery now. We only formally outlawed it um, rhetorically, as Evola said, uh, in places like the U.S. and in uh, other nations around the world in this uh, neoliberal lie of egalitarianism. And no one in my class at the time, uh, because we were dealing with, you know, aspects of uh, slavery and um, the, the Civil War in the South and all these other uh, new narratives of the um, new founding myths of the American empire. Uh, and I had brought these questions up that no one could really grapple with in any way. No, no one could you know, take and chew and digest, except for a select few that, you know, I was already friends with. And I understood that they had the intellectual capacity to kind of understand these things. But it was shocking to see how far behind most of my peers and even, you know, my teachers uh, were uh, in trying to understand these concepts. Um, and I had three of them in that class. One, because it was a combined sort of makeshift college course. It wasn't exactly an AP. It was something more localized through uh, my my state university in a cooperation with my, my high school. But um, history teacher, English teacher, and an understudy or um, uh, whatever he was doing there for his own degree to become a teacher as well, couldn't really grapple with the contest I was bringing up in the formal you know, dictations of the, the slave castes that we had in, say, like the antebellum South or in, you know, ancient Greece or uh, wherever this institution of slavery was practiced, where people were calling it, you know, an abomination or a um, dredge on the, the state of affairs of modern man and so on and so forth. But departing from that system only led to more nefarious and insidious aspects of slavery to come about, especially through the financial and economic systems that we have uh, to uh, prop up these artificial uh, technocracies that we've developed for ourselves, um, sort of as a consequence of the, tech, of the Industrial Revolution, but even preceding that in some respects as well. And, you know, you have things like debt slavery, or you have things like um, aid dependence on the state for any amount of, um, you know, living needs, the moochers versus the, um, the monetized, as, as I kind of want to coin it, where you have these parasitic aspects, which is a smaller portion of society, kind of um, riding off the labor of the wider population of the slave caste we have it now. So it's kind of like a sub-slave class of the slave caste. And then you have the monetizing workforce that is, you know, propping the system up and keeping the machine going, as I kind of alluded to before, um, just for the sake of keeping it going. And then the ones at the helm of the machine are kind of just imbuing some sort of sense of direction on there through their own transhumanist or other ideological agendas that don't really have any substance or spiritual guidance there themselves. It's all relative to their own um, material or... Uh, temporal lifespans and desires and it's a far far more um evil structure 
than any argument that uh, was made against or, or um, example that could be given of the previous institutions of slavery that we've had because it's uh, to the point that most people don't consider themselves a slave. It's it's tricked the general population to thinking that they are free to make whatever choices that aren't really um, of consequence to the system as a whole, like someone um, as wise to these lies uh, as Ted Theodore Kaczynski was. Um, and he pointed out in his, you know, uh, penning of um, industrial society and its future. Uh, and so it's, it's these different aspects of our um, slave state as we have it globally that have ground down these individual aspects of all these different cultures and things and universalized them in the worst possible ways. And that was one thing I, I did want to bring on or talk about, but we may save for another uh, video on the different types of universalism, this, this duality of neoliberal universalism and the universalism that we as uh, praxists as adhere to and how there is a distinct difference between them and how the universalism that we're opposed to is a downwards oriented spiral of degeneracy as we see infecting our society and the universalism that we're trying to approach again and that things like Christianity are founded or um, inherently imbued with is a transcendent upward oriented one that cannot be compared to the uh, the other and people in our sphere of things like academic agent or um, uh, bronze age pervert uh, or so on and so forth will confuse these things uh, inherently or even you know broader groups like um, the neo-pagans and so forth get these things inherently wrong because they try and um, present these types of universalism as the same thing and that only kind of reinforces this obfuscation that has been created through this uh you know modern slave caste that we uh are a part of yeah exactly and you know it's 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 a difficult issue to navigate as well because there will always be the necessity for labor and for the low the lowly work to be getting done there will always be a need for work you know and so there is always going to be a massive amount of people more people than any other function performing this work as opposed to you know being a, a priest or a warrior or something like that even if they are uh even now at, at if, if they were to be a warrior they would be performing this 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 type of work same thing with the priest mm -hmm. this this work is this work characterizes the modern age and the slave state um like not not the institution of slavery but the state of being a slave um is like the the slave state is everyone's state now everyone is kind of a slave except in, unless you're like one of the you know one percent of the one percent you are essentially a slave to someone else's um economic interests and that's what evola was saying in the chapter was essentially that he said you know they use uh the they use the the economic tyranny to in a sense bring about the most dreadful form if not if not perhaps the most physically violent form or the most abhorrent form it's certainly the most dreadful form of slavery that's ever existed because this is one where there is a sort of uh it has that end of history air to it in a sense where you know this is essentially how we are going to live our lives forever now there is no there is no end to this type of slavery and uh, there is no spiritual actualization to be found in it either. Where before, you know, they have the slave caste, and even though it might have been a uh, a conditioned uh, creation of the traditional society, even still, the slave caste still did have some type of access to spiritual ascension. Where in our society today, um, with our current slave situation today, there is no offered spiritual ascension. It is all materialistic and anything besides the uh the condition of a slave that is offered is something either even more downwards oriented than the uh the state of being a slave which is usually something hedonistic or materialistically pleasurable um or something that might mislead the person into doing something that benefits um someone else 
materially or physically. So, again, there is no spiritual ascension that is associated with modern slavery, which is why it's characterized as being the most dreadful form of it. Um, but I think that about wraps up the conversation. Do you have anything else you want to add? No, that that's pretty much everything on the, uh, the three, three chapters. Yep, I've pretty much exercised my list. Um, so the next time, I guess we can, we can decide what chapters we'll be doing off recording. But uh, yeah, I would like to thank everybody for tuning into today's podcast. This was rather a long one for these uh, book reviews. Normally they, they range from an hour to an hour and a half. This one's about two hours and 15 minutes or some odd, something like that. Um, so Once yeah. we edit it down, it'll be about two hours. Yeah, something like that. Um, but yeah, I would like to thank everybody for tuning in. And uh, make sure to leave a like if you do think that the video deserved one. Leave a comment if you have something to say. That way we can... Uh, gauge the interaction a little bit more with the with the channel and all that make sure that uh you know the algorithm promotes us and all that and uh, be a little more confident but come on it, you know you're gonna like this video because you came all the way to the end of it, it, it we, we had a great conversation here give us a like leave comments <laughs> and questions below because you know these are such big brain concepts you're gonna have all these different questions to, you know ask the intellectual guys like vincent and i to, to answer for you you gotta you gotta do it like that Vinny. there you go there you go um, but yes, thank you for being here. Um, until next time, I'm Vincent. Thank you once again, Cody. As always. And I hope to see you back here next time at the Praxis Table Talks.